than any need you have. How great is your God? Is your God? How great is our God? How great is our God? How great, how great is our God? Hallelujah. Give the Lord a clap of worship this morning. Hallelujah. When I think how great God is. And yet, He knows us by name. He just don't know you. He knows all about you, doesn't He? Amen. What a mighty God. I'm going to make a few announcements now. This coming Thursday night, Christmas Eve, will not have service. So you can spend that with your family or cooking or what you want to do. That's just to enjoy your Christmas Eve. Uh, next Sunday, we'll be back here. And it's going to be awesome because you haven't heard the message yet. I'm telling you, I, w I want you to look around this morning. You'll never see this again. Come on. Come on. Come on. It's changing. I've heard, I've heard from God. You're gonna hear, I'm going to give you some God prophecy this morning. Yeah. What a mighty God. But then New Year's Eve, the following Thursday, not this Thursday, the following Thursday, we're going to be having a New Year's Eve service, and you don't want to miss it. We're going to be doing communion out here. We're going to move the tables, or move the chairs, and we'll have tables. And when you come in, it'll be set up. We're going to worship, do communion here. And then when it's all over, we're going to have a little fellowship in, the, in our fellowship hall. So come expecting. And I know we have some people don't like to drive at night. Do it this night. You're, you don't want to miss this. And I'll even tell you the theme that we're going to have for New Year's Eve is a relationship with Jesus Christ. A relationship with Jesus Christ. and uh, there, I, I'm just excited about what God's doing and what he's fixing to do. And, and I just want you to, I mean, please, God can do exactly what he says. Yes. I mean, knows God says he's not man that he should lie. What he says he can do. Amen? Love that verse. So God's about to do something mighty. We're going to go ahead and uh, let Sister Becky bless your offering this morning. And those that are watching, if you would like to give, we appreciate all those. Let's give them a hand. So many people. We are so blessed at this little church, the views that we get from far and near, and the response that we get. It's just awesome. Last Sunday, I kind of touched on some toes a little bit, <laughs> and I heard from quite a few Muslim people. That's all right. We still believe in the same Jesus. We believe in there's only one door, and that's Jesus Christ. Hello. But you know what? Every one of them wanted to be friends, so they want to hear more. And so we don't back up on the word. We hold to it. So I'm telling you, today, all those that watch us, we appreciate you, and if you'd like to give into this, into our church, into our ministry, all you have to do is hit the give button. It'll show you how to do that, and uh, all those that watch us on YouTube and on Facebook. And so we want to bless you this morning, and if you'll hold up your right hand, those that are watching too, even though you may not have an offering, hold it up by faith right now, and Sister Becky, bless it. Amen. This is my tithe and offering, and it will do what God says it will do. The windows of heaven are open over me and my house, and such blessings have been released that I do not have adequate room to contain them all. I am the seed of Abraham, and the oath God swore to him is my inheritance. Therefore, I release my tithes and my offering to the fertile soul of his presence. In Jesus' name, be blessed. And the church says, Amen. 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 Somebody give the Lord a praise of worship. I want to show you how giving to God blesses. This happened to this church this past week. Uh, we, we won't mention names because I, I don't think that sometimes it's wise, but uh, we were blessed with a, with a, a, a $4,500 to give to children or orphan home. We gave it to an orphan home. And uh, we gave, they, were, they had 45 kids, or actually, 
in this nursing home. We are children's home, not nursing home, children's home. And we found out later they actually have more in the foster care, but this is just in the in the boy in the children's home. But we get we gave each one a hundred dollar forty five hundred a hundred dollar gift certificate. Our church was blessed to do that to be a part of. And when we did that, the director told me, he said, after you gave that, told us you were coming to give that, he said there was another church in the town on up, heard about it, and they matched you dollar for dollar. So when you give, God blesses, amen? And that is so awesome. Not only does God bless you, he blesses them. I believe it was somebody I went to Israel with. Uh, that had done that. God's an awesome God. And, and I'm going to say this is, this is going to be, to me, it's a very encouraging word this morning. It's also a very, it's, it's one of them words that's encouraging but also calls you to duty. And uh, I, I believe that this week God has shown me some things and he spoke to me. And I'm going to share some with you. I won't share them all with you this morning. And I don't know if I'll get through this whole message this morning. Who knows? Sometimes I get started, I can't quit. <laughs> but we, if we have to two-part it, we'll do the rest next Sunday. And so if you, those that are not here, they can get the DVD. And we, we say this to anybody that's watching anything, if you'd like a DVD, if you, for some reason you can't download it or you can't to your computer, all you have to do is let us know. We'll, we'll do our best to get you one. We have sent them to California, well, all over. We send them all over. At times, we send prayer calls. We sent some prayer calls once to California. A woman called us, and her son was at death's door. And she said, I want a prayer call that God, so we preached God is a healer and that the price has been paid. And when she got the prayer call, she took it to her son. He didn't even have to have surgery. They dismissed him from the hospital. But she wrote back a, a week later, and she had come down sick. And she said, and I don't know if she understood healing by what she said. She said, that cloth worked so good on my son, I want one. <laughs> and so we wrote her a letter explaining that the cloth is just a point of contact, but that we believe that God is a healer. And uh, it was, so I'm telling you, it's awesome. I, I, I'll say this, and, and this, this happened 23 years ago. Almost 24, I guess it's been 24 years ago now, is one of our, we hadn't, we just got a telephone in the church. This was when we was renting a building. And I want to tell you something about people. I'm not, I'm not being bad. Or, I'm just telling this is a fact. No matter what the church does, there's a group of people that don't like it. And so when we got a telephone, you wouldn't believe the chewing out I got. Church don't need a telephone. Church don't need a telephone. That's foolishness. I mean, they, I was getting chewed out one side of the other, and I said, well, this church needs one. And the first service after... After we had the telephone put in, we didn't have no room so you could hear it ring. And uh, I think Sister Becky answered it. It was a family from, it wasn't Houston, Texas, somewhere in Texas, maybe Dallas, I forget, it's been 20 some years. And somehow one of our prayer calls had made it to the waiting room of the ICU in that, ho in that hospital. And this family's dad, they would called the whole family in, and he had had just a two or three hours to live. And so the family had been in there, and, and so one of them seen that prayer call, picked it up, tucked it in the ICU, and laid it on their dad, and said, we just going to believe you're healed. And they called us like an hour later, and he was being dismissed, Come on. going home. And, and that was right in her Sunday night service, and so we just got to share. And, and so I'm just telling you something. My God is a mighty God, yeah. and God's about to do something. Would you bow your heads? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity and this privilege. I thank you, Lord, for each one that's here. And God, I ask, Lord, that as it comes time that we break the bread of life, God, that, Lord, that you'll just anoint our mind, anoint my tongue, God. Let me just speak the words that you would have me to speak. I ask, Lord, that you open our hearts, Lord, that the seed of the Word of God can be sown into the heart, that it brings forth much fruit. In the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. devil rebuke you, rebuke you. you do not steal, steal. Kill, kill, or destroy. 
this word. And the church says, Amen. give the Lord a clap. If you have your Bibles, I forgot to tell you, Luke 10 and the first two verses. Would you stand? You can read it. If, if, the, if we're working fast, you can read it. <laughs> Luke 10, verses number 1. I'm gonna, is it coming up or should I go ahead? There it is. That way you can read it with me. It says, After these things, the Lord appointed another 70 also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore, he said unto them, The harvest is truly great, but the labors are few. Pray you, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth labors into the harvest. And the church says, Amen. you may be seated. I'm going to share just a little bit with you before we get into the Word. If some of you remember I said this. If you don't care, give me just a little bit of volume on 13 for some reason. I don't know if it's my hearing or you're hearing me good. But for some reason I feel muffled. Uh, about, you probably remember about two months ago, I was driving to Knoxville, I believe it's Knoxville, going somewhere, and I was praying, that's, that's some of my best praying time, or, I, I, and the Spirit of the Lord just come into the vehicle, and the Lord spoke this to my heart, and I mean, sometimes when God speaks to your heart, it's like you hear it, and he said, if I send you labors, will you work them? I thought, I knew there was more to this, but I knew what labors were, too. And I shared that, I, know, I don't know if I shared it with the whole church, but I know that I shared it with some people. And I, I hadn't forgot it, but I kind of just kept it in the back of my mind. And so about two or three weeks ago, maybe four, even though I was having... I was hearing from God. We were having great services. God was giving me dreams and visions. For some strange reason, there was a cloud of darkness, heaviness, that I could not shake. It just weighed on me. And this went on for a week, a week, several weeks. And I could not, I, when I was, I would feel the anointing, I would worship. But when push come to shove, that pressure come on me, that weight. I, sometimes in my mind, I attribute it maybe to what's going on because I'm telling you, this is a time pastors are really under a load. And I understand there's pastors all over the world that just gave it up. There's churches without pastors right now. I kind of understand a little bit of that. Don't believe in it, but I understand it. And so... Monday morning, I believe it was Monday morning. Oh, I get up early, so I don't know what time it was. Maybe 536. I was listening to a prophecy by Kent Christmas. Yeah, he's I, I listened to I've listened to him for a few years. And he's a, he's an awesome man of God, I do believe. And so I I'm I'm sitting there listening to it on my phone and I just come, got through out of my prayer closet, and I'm listening to this. And this is what he said. He began to say, he said, God showed him this heaviness that's on the, the church around the world. And I thought, man, I can, it kind of touched me. He said, God showed me that it's lifting even starting now. And I can, I can only say this for me, immediately. I mean, not one second later, right then, I said, Lord, I need that. Immediately, it's gone. Yes. Oh. And if you, if you understand and you, and, you, and you pray in the Spirit and you know how God speaks, immediately I begin to download. I mean, God began to show me things so fast. Brother Doug, I was having a hard time just keeping up with it. And I, I, I listened to some more of his prophecy, and it was awesome. But God was yelling it to me before he was saying it. I said, awesome. But then God 
into this, he spoke to me two things. And that's what I'm going to minister on this morning. The number one, the first thing that God said, and, and maybe Kent said this, I don't know. Yeah, I'd have to go back and listen. I hadn't listened to it since. But there's an awakening that's coming to the world, and 2021 will be the year of a mighty awakening to the Spirit of God. And I, here I am preaching this on a Sunday when our attendance is low, low. And I'm thinking, God, you could at least give me a church full of preachers because I'm going to give some prophecy that's going to be, I'm going to give you something that's going to be out of this world. But there's coming this great awakening. And an awakening is I'm talking about a move of God. Well, the first thing that God told me it had to happen And, and boy, when God tells you something plain, does it not get your attention? Here's what God told me. He said, you're praying wrong. I didn't even think about it. You, I don't know. What, can you really pray wrong? Yes. God says, you're praying wrong. And I just got through praying. <laughs> and God says, my people's praying wrong. He says they're praying for a harvest. But I never asked them to pray for a harvest. I never told them to pray for a harvest. You see, we'll pray this way. We'll say, God, send us a mighty harvest. I'm going to show you why you don't pray for a harvest in a minute. Then he will pray, God, we need a harvest. We need a harvest. But what did it say right there? He did not say pray for a harvest. He said pray for laborers to go into the harvest. And I thought, well, what's the difference? I'm going to show you just a little bit in the difference. But here's what God told me. I'm going to give you a prophecy right now that God told me. He said at the House of God Worship Center, he didn't say House of God Worship Center, but I pastor here and he spoke this to this church to me to tell you. If we will begin to pray for labors and get our mind off of what our needs and begin to pray for labors, God says by the end of January, we will see a great flow of people begin to come into the house of God Worship Center. You say, ain't there nobody here? You mark it down. Brother Doug, I'm going to join in your prophecy. When God says something, he'll do it. But he said, I'll show you my hand. And people say, but, but pastor, why is the difference? We, we don't know. Nobody wants to hear the word. I'm going to tell you something. We've been praying wrong. How many times have you ever heard an evangelist or every time you go on a revival? If we can just get one person saved, it's worth it all. That's the most foolish statement I've ever heard. Come on. For number one is you should never hold a meeting for, to get one saved. You should hold a meeting because the harvest... Go into the harvest. Quit praying for the harvest. And so listen to what he said. Let's go here just for a second. Here's what God said. Go back to, uh, put up the whole verse. Luke 10, 2. I, I wanted, there's two, three quick points I'm going to make. I'm going to try to hurry. He said the harvest truly is what? In other words, don't be praying for one soul. The harvest is great. Understand that we have to have a harvest. We need laborers. You say, Pastor, what's the difference? I tell you what, we got enough seat warmers. We need laborers. I, I, I thought about this, and uh, when God began to tell me this, I remember this. I read this back in the 70s, early 70s, mid-70s early, mid-70s. Rex Humbart was probably the greatest, the first, they give him credit for breaking ground for Pentecostals being on TV. He's, he opened this up. They had been some before him, but none like him. 
He had one of the largest Pentecostal churches for years. When Rex Humbard went to Akron, Ohio, I, I read it, this in a statement, a little booklet. When he got off the bus in Akron, Ohio, he had $25 in his pocket, and he had his guitar strapped to his back. He said, that's all I had. He said, I knew that God would grant me anything I asked him for. He said, because God had already told me, you go to Akron, I'll bless you. He said, I knelt down on the sidewalk right outside the bus station, and I prayed this prayer. I said, God, I'm not asking for money. I'm not asking for a building. I'm not asking for nothing except, he said, I want 10 people that love you as much as I do and that will work as hard as I do. And he said, God, if you give me 10 people, I'll turn Akron into a Christian city. Wow. When I first, years ago, I was about this tall, and first time I pull, we pulled into that church, I'd never seen something so big in all my life. Because you know what? He understood when you pray for laborers, nothing's impossible. Can somebody say praise the Lord? And, and so now... We're, going to, we're looking for a great harvest, and we're looking for somebody to go into the harvest. I want to go to John 4.35, just a second. I'm just laying the foundation. I'm going to preach in a minute. But I want you to understand a little bit about harvest. This is what Jesus said. Say ye not, there are four months. We're always wanting the revival next week, next year, next time. He didn't come with the harvest. He said, behold, I say, lift up your eyes in the fields, on the fields, and they are already white. You know why the harvest is always ready? Because we have nothing to do with it. I'm going to show you this in the Word. God has the harvest. We don't have nothing to do with the harvest. That's why he said, why, why are you praying for God to do something he's already done? Why are you asking God to increase the harvest when he's done got it out there? You see, if we begin to change our way of thinking, and we begin to see what God's about to do, if we will just let God use us, something good's going to happen, and it's going to be mighty. And so he said here, he said, look on the fields. They're ready for harvest. And, and this is what I want to say. Sometimes... We think that we are the harvest, that we make the harvest. We don't. Apostle Paul said this way, he said, one of you will sow. Somebody else might water, but who makes the harvest? God does. And so... When we begin to understand God's got this great harvest outside this. How many knows that God's got a harvest in Claiborne County that there's not enough church to hold the people? And if God says it's ready to harvest. You see, there's times if you plant a garden or you plant something, when it's planted, it's not ready to harvest. When it's watered, it's not ready to harvest. But they come a time... That the harvest is ready, and if you don't go into that season, you will not receive the harvest. And can I give you a prophecy? 2021 is going to be a harvest year because the harvest is ready, and God says, let's go. Yes. Come on. So we come. We have the harvest, and we're praying for labors. Let's go to Matthew 9, 38 just for a second. Now, when you read Matthew 9, 38, even before I get into it, I want to tell you something. In, in our Bibles, we have verses and chapters. It wasn't written that way. When you read 9, 38, that wasn't the end to chapter 9, 38. You do not, you cannot understand this scripture until you start into chapter, what we call chapter 10. And this is what the Lord said, pray you therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send you into what? 
in, into whose harvest? Do you understand? It's not our harvest. It's the Lord's harvest. This is what I'm trying to say. So many times we pray, God, fill our churches. Fill this. Do this. We're wanting God to do this. And God says, the harvest is mine. And all I need is somebody to go into the harvest. I'm feeling the anointing begin to move. I'm trying not to get too stirred up by will. I can't help it. It is my nature. So, now, the Lord says, the harvest is his. Do you know you can't enter the harvest if you're not ready? Yep. You know what the problem is the last 15 years while we haven't seen a great move of God in America? We have unqualified people trying to harvest in their own harvest instead of going into God's harvest qualified. Come on. Come on. Does that make sense? Yep. And, and so we've got so many people that says, oh, I'm in the harvest. No, you're not. God doesn't care if you got a $20 million building or a barn. Come on. Do you hear me? God don't care if you drive a Ford or a Mercedes. It don't make you a good preacher either way. Or a laborer. God, this is what God says. Go to Luke or Matthew 10 and 1. He called his disciples, the 12 of them, and if you go to Luke 10 and 1, it says he also called 70 more. So for those that says this is just disciples, read the Bible. Come on. It's for everybody. And so this is what he says. He called them together, and he gave them what? You cannot go into the harvest without power. Come on. Come on. Glory to God. You'll see this later on. But you say, but pastor, we all have the same power. I beg the difference. You don't have the power. I don't have the power. He's got the power, and he gives it to us. Do you give somebody that's not willing to go into harvest, will they have the same power as somebody that goes into the harvest? Think about that. Why would they? Will God give power to somebody, can I preach a minute, to be a seat warmer, when we're not in the harvest. I told you this was going to be encouraged, but I also told you it'd stir you a little bit. You see, we, we're, we're going into harvest, and all of a sudden the Lord says, I'm going to give him power against unclean spirits to cast out devils. Read them. To cast out. To cast them out. To heal all manners of what? And all manner of diseases. This is what God showed me. I'm not going deep in this because I don't want to be discouraging. But there's going to be some shakening take place in 2021 in the world. The answer is not going to be in the doctors. The answer is not going to be in Washington, D.C. or the U.N. building. The answer is going to be with those that have the power of God. Glory to God. It, this is what Kent prophesied. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because you have to listen to this. is my word. He said that God in 2021, it, actually before, he said God's taken the nobodies. Yes. So those that, that everybody's given up on. Those that have never been successful at anything in ministry. Those that are new to the ministry. Those that don't even know what ministry is. And he's going to give them the power to go into the harvest. Glory to God. I'm going to tell you something. I may have been around in this a while, but I want to be one of them that goes into the harvest. I want to be one of those that lay hands on the sick and see them healed. I want to be one of those that cast out. One of those that do signs and wonders in the power in the work of God. Now, if you would very quickly, let's go down to 10, 7, 8, then I'm going to actually get to my message. It won't be a long message, but it just takes me a while to get there sometimes. Jesus told him, he said, when you go, preach, saying the kingdom of God is at hand. When about 
I guess it's been 20 some years ago. Probably a good 20 years. When God called us into the street ministry at this church, I'd been going down there for about five months. I went down there, I think it was every Wednesday. I'd met thousands of people. I prayed for thousands of people. But out of the thousands, every person I met told me the same thing, about 90% of them. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. But yet they were still addicted to drugs. They were still in prostitution. They were still thieving. They were still in a simple way. So one day I was praying, I still worked at the time, and, and I, I was in maintenance, so I went to different factories. And I was going somewhere, and this, the Lord began to speak, so I just pulled the van over. Sometimes when the Spirit comes great, I knew it wasn't safe to drive, so I just pulled over the side of the road. And I said, God, I said, I need to know one thing. Why in the world are you sending me the people already are saved? that's when the Lord told me to read Luke 4, 18. And I had a little Bible there, and I flipped it over, and I read it. I knew what it said, but I read it. And this is what the Spirit said. I'm not, said, they know of me. He said, you're going to walk among them and show them who I am. And he told me right then, he said, signs and wonders and miracles is every time I pray. What an awesome God. Sister Becky was there from day one. The others, there wasn't a Friday night went by. We didn't see divine miracles. The first Friday night, we had over 160 people that I counted saved. More than that. We went back on Saturday night and had another that many. The city of Knoxville estimated that our crowds would be between 600 and 700, maybe 800. We, we didn't even advertise. We showed up. But you know what brought people around? The miracle power of God. Brother West was supposed to be here this morning. I guess he couldn't make it. But he was in working out of, out of the country and down in the... Puerto Rico, I guess. And he said he had went back on God. He was drinking and doing whatever. He said, I don't know if he's in a motel room at a bar, but he said on the TV screen come a little country preacher in the middle of the, of the city of Knoxville doing great works. And he said, that's my brother. And he said, if my brother can do it, I can do it. And he gave his heart back to God. Can I say this? I'm telling you, what's about to happen is mighty. Let me get on before I get this message. Give the Lord a worship. Give me some help this morning. Let's go down to uh, number eight just for a second. This is the harvest. The souls of the harvest. This is what you do. How many believes you still heal the sick? Let me ask you a question. Do you have to ask permission to heal the sick? So what do you do? He gave you power to do it. Yep. Now, can I, can I mess with your theology a little bit? Because this really gripes people. Do you have to ask permission to save somebody? No. No. You say, Pastor, you don't save them. You pronounce them saved. We don't heal them, but we, we say we healed them. You see... We don't beg God for these things because God says, I gave them to you. We raised the dead. We cast out devils. Freely you have to. So the harvest, if you think the harvest is going to be a bunch of people holding hands and saying, we are the world, you're missing something. You know what the harvest is going to be? You're going to walk down the street, and there are going to be people laying all over, laid out in the spirit. There are going to be empty wheelchairs. There are going to be doctors and hospitals complaining. Where's my people? We can't have the answer, but God's still moving. You see, I'm telling you, 
The answer is not in man, it's in God. If the church would, oh, can I, can I be bold for a minute? If the church would get the Holy Ghost boldness that we need and begin to preach what needs to be preached, we would see God begin to do great and wonderful things because He would send us into the harvest. We need to quit just being that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk, get to awakening now. The first awakening that the world ever known, the great awakening, and Brother Russell taught on it this morning, it start, there's a three part, three things happen. In Luke 2.11, it says, for, for this day a child is born, a Savior is born unto you. There was there had to be a virgin birth. I know this will upset many that listen to this, but it, you have to believe in the virgin birth. You cannot. It's a virgin birth. The second part of this is one of my favorite scriptures, Matthew 28, 6. They have to be a birth, and then it says, He is not here, He is risen. If we do not understand the risen Savior, there's no sense to go into the harvest. And the third part of the great awakening, that, that the reason we have the gospel right here, is the promise. Jesus said in Acts 1 and 4, he said, wait on this promise. You say, what's the promise? What did Acts 1 and 5 say? John baptized with water, but one's coming after me. He's going to baptize you with what? The Holy Ghost. So the promise is what? The Holy Ghost. Who lives in you? Who's with you? You know, sometimes when we read John 14, the chapter 14, the Holy Spirit will never leave you. He's there with you all the time. And so what, what happened on the Great Awakening, the first one that started what we should call the church today, is there was a virgin birth, there was a death and resurrection, and then there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And that church began. We've had great awakenings since, and I'm not going to go through them. We've had the Luke, Martin Luther, the Calvins, John Wesley, some of the great men of God, and some of them. But I'm going to go just very quickly, because of time, to the 1900s in America, because I'm preaching to America right now. Actually, it started in the early 1800s in North Carolina in the Indian reservations, the Cherokee Indian reservations. It went to Los Angeles, California on the Zuzu Street. It come to these mountains right here. And it also was in Oklahoma and Kansas. That was the three major places that the outpouring began, the Great Awakening. What it was, you already had the virgin birth. And you already had the risen Savior. But through the years... Through the years, people got away from what God said. Kind of like today. Everybody had a doctrine suits them. You know what happened in America in the 1900s? There was a renewing of the Holy Spirit. Man, it fell. Services went 24-7 in Zuzu Street. Around the clock. God, people, millions of people come from all over the world and received. Some of your great faith preachers received their ministry at Azuzu Street. It was an outpouring. And these mountains right here, I know about this. I've read and studied, and I know there was several of the major organizations today started in 1906. 19, between 19 and 1906. And they started because of outpouring. There was no such thing in this part of the country as a Pentecostal church of anything. It wasn't even known. So us Pentecostals, we've got to be careful. It's not a denomination. It's a move of God. 
I'm tired of people saying, you belong to this domination. No, it's not a domination. It's just Bible. I don't even like to title it because then you've isolated yourself. But there was a move of God begin to sweep. Miracles begin to happen. And from this 1900 awakening led into, from 1940 to the early 1960s, there was major faith healers that had tents that would seat 10 some of them, 15, 20,000. God done miracles in front of the eyes of people day in, day out. You can, people say anything you want. Some of these men may have, may have not done what man thought they should do, but at one time they were a man of God. And God used them mightily. And everybody's seen it. That's for TV. People would come by the groves. I, you can still go and see film. I seen A. Allen pre- pray for a, a boy one time that had no bones in his legs. They just flop. He prayed for him a while, set him down, that boy began to walk. That's before 10,000, 15,000 people. They say Jack Cole was one of the bravest. He would line them up by the hundreds that had cancer. He'd have people to carry cans. And he'd just reach, if he, if he could see it, he'd reach and get it, pull it off people. They'd throw it up. When he left hundreds of people with no cancer. These were great men of God. And it started because of the awakening. In 2020, we're in a time when it seems like people have forgot about who God is. They, they say, well, there's a supreme being, but they don't acknowledge him. We're in a time when our government don't even respect God at all. They make decisions and do not even consider God. We're in a time when the churches are empty. We're in a time when fear abounds so much among people that there's panicking. And this is what God told me. He said, I'm sending an awakening. The rising of a move of God. That's going to sweep this country. But he says you have to pray for labors. It cannot happen unless somebody goes into the harvest. It can't happen. We can't sit in church and pray for a move of God and not go into the harvest. If we're going to pray for it, let's go into the harvest. And this is what he said. And God began to speak to me. This is what he said. He said the first phase of this awakening has already begun. There's a scripture that I've heard quoted about 500 times in the last year, maybe another 500 years before. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. The first phase that we're going to see is a repentance. Man, I feel this. Can I preach what God gave me? Or you want me to water it down? This is what he said. There's two phases to repentance that we're going to see. Number one, the first thing, and I'm going to, t- I'm going to get to just in a second, is the prodigals are coming home. Do you know how many thousands and millions of people in the world right now once knew God and they're out in the world because they've been hurt, offended, or they just got turned off you know what God says I haven't forgot them I'm drawing them in well glory let me say a religion can't push somebody out that God wants to come in he says you're going to see them come in you're going to see people begin to weep and repent and God says I'm going to restore their joy and restore their peace we're going to see the prodigal come home the number t- next thing God says we're going to see we're going to see people that's never heard about God, people that never walked in a church house, people that don't even know that there is a Jesus. They're going to hear about Jesus, and they're going to let Jesus come into their heart and life, and immediately we're going to see a life change. Come on now, the very people that are repenting is the one God's going to send back into the harvest. Can somebody say amen? So I want to show you three things that God says I'm going to do in this harvest. And I'm going to go to the book of Luke. I've done left my notes. (laughs) 
In Luke, the 15th chapter and the 20 verse, this is, you go back a little bit and then you can read about the prodigal son. And the prodigal son, all he done was tuck his inheritance and he just blew them, wasted them. He found himself in a foreign country and he had nothing. He was working for somebody and the Bible says as he was feeding the hogs, he desired to eat the husk of the of what they were eating, but they could not. And then he thought to himself, he said, in my father's house, the servants eat better than this. He said, I'm going back home. And this is what the Lord says is going to happen. It says, when he arose and came to his father, but when he was a great way off, his father did what? And did what? He ran? You mean that God ran to them? Ain't the way I was taught. You say, but pastor, what's going to happen? These people that are turning to God in this awakening, are going, God's going to run to meet them, and they're going to run to meet God. You, let me tell you something. We've never seen a time that's about to happen. You know how we're used to getting people saved? Giving sad stories and bagging and pleading, getting them up to the altar, let them pray a little sinner's prayer, patting on the back, and sending them back up. This is going to be a life-changing experience that's going to happen because they're going to meet God in the highways and the byways. Everywhere they go, they're going to see God. God's going to love them. Those that have been, that's the prodigals he's going to love. The new ones he's going to love. And this is three things that will happen. When the father got his son, he said, bring me the robe. The best robe. He didn't say a robe. He said, bring me the best robe. A robe is a covering. And this is what I heard in the Spirit. The Lord says, when these people call on me. Stand up just a second, Sister Becky. I just want to demonstrate just a second. Somehow I love doing this. He says, I am going to cover them. You know why? Because God's tired of the rotating door of the modern church. Stand right there a second. He's tired. You know what? We pick them green. We don't let God come into the heart. We tell them everything's all right. All we're interested is in a number, a tithe, and a church membership. God says he has the membership. Hallelujah. What's he going to do? He said, I'm going to cover him with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to cover him with my glory. You know what that does, Brother Tony? Every time something comes against him, it has to go through the Holy Spirit. Every time something comes, it has to go through the glory of God. Tell me God can't change life. Church, we've been doing it all wrong. We're trying to train people how to live this way or that way. All you got to do is let the Holy Ghost, let God put the robe or the covering on them, and nothing can penetrate them. Can somebody say praise the Lord? Do you see? You say, can you sit down now? You say, Pastor, how can God use somebody that's never been trained? How can you use somebody? Because he's covering them. Then you know what he said I'm going to do to him? He said, bring me the ring. And put it on their finger. You know what the ring represents? When you have the ring of the kingdom on, that means you have authority of the king. Point simple. In other words, when God told the 70 and told the disciples on the day of Pentecost that 3,000 got saved, when he told them, I put the robe on, he also put the ring on them. That's why Peter, on his way to pray, Peter and John, they seen the lame man that had been there for many, many years, and he, was wanting, oh, he wasn't wanting healed. He was wanting some money to buy his living. He was... He had a permit to do this. Peter said, I ain't got no money. I'm putting in country boy language. Peter said, silver and gold. Us country boys, I ain't got nothing, man. But what I have, 
He got him and he picked him up. And he pulled him up. The Bible said immediately the man began to leap and jump and praise the Lord. Why? Because the authority that was placed upon him. Every person that's here that knows Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior has the same authority. Wow. Pastor, I've never done that. That's the trouble. We've never been taught to do it. Yep. We keep praying for the harvest when God says, no, pray for the labors. Yep. And so we put the ring on them. You think God's going to send you in front of a harvest and not give you the power to operate? Come on. Wouldn't that be foolish? Wouldn't it be foolish? When God sent me out in the, in the home was just very quickly. The first thing he done is he took fear away from me. Because many times I was in very dangerous situations. I never feared. Because I knew who I was. And the next thing is, when I prayed, he moved. I didn't. He just moved. Sometimes I'd sit in amazement and say, God, did you see what you just done? It was his harvest. It had nothing to do with me. I was just a laborer that was willing to go. And this is what God's going to do to you. Those that want it, he's going to send you in the harvest. Most people are going to say, man, that's too dangerous. I said this back eight months ago, maybe nine months ago, at the beginning of all this stuff. I said if I was called and was allowed, permitted, I'd walk into any hospital. If everybody in there had COVID, I'd walk in there and pray for every one of them. I would not fear. I would still do it today. I would not wear a mask. I would not wear gloves I'd, if, unless they required them. I would go in. You say, but why, Pastor? Because I know that God gave me the authority. When I was on the streets working, not just me, the others, and, and this was the, I threw away more clothes because of this. But literally, we, I wouldn't get home at about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. And I'd get home, and that's what time Sister Becky and I got home, and I would go in the bathroom to shower, and my clothes would be covered in blood. I didn't know it because it was kind of, we just had lights for the altar. We didn't light everything up. We poured. <laughs> and I didn't know it. And people would say, you're going to get AIDS. Never crossed my mind. The city of Knoxville called me to a meeting one time. Some of the people... And they said, we know what you're doing, and we appreciate what you're doing, but you're living too dangerously. They said, we want to put up a safety place, and we want you to wear a tie back and gloves that when you pray for these people, you can come in and change. And I politely stood up. There's other churches there. I said, I don't mean to upset no one. I said, I'm not trying to be a hard case. I said, but if my God can't take care of me, I don't have no business there. And I walked out. Me and Brother Pearl. We walked out. Can I say the same thing? He's still God. Yeah. No matter what happens, he's still God. Oh, I ain't Superman. I don't want COVID-19. I don't want none of that. But I know who my God is. I mean, if I get it tomorrow, I won't worry about it. in God's hands. Boy, my God's a healer. And so, he put the authority on us, the ring. You see, it's only good if you use it. Authority is only good if you use it. If you read that story about the prodigal son, he had an older brother that had the same ring that did not do nothing and got jealous when the young one did it. Because why? He had the authority, but he never used it. And the next thing, and this is, the, I'm going to close here in a second, 
is the father said, bring me some shoes. And every time I read this, I think about Joshua. Moses, God gave Moses the boundaries. And he gave Joshua the boundaries. You can read it. Joshua 1. He said from the Euphrates River, and he goes on, he gives them. But then God said this to Joshua. He said, everywhere the soles of your feet shall tread, I give you. In other words, and I heard this from a Jewish rabbi, if Joshua left the boundaries, it was Jezreel's. Did you hear what I said? God says, I'll enlarge it, Joshua, if you want to enlarge it. That's what he was saying. He said, everywhere the soles of your feet go, I will give you. So why in the world would a church today be satisfied with one soul? Why would we be satisfied with ten? Everywhere the soles of your feet shall tread, I will give you. Come on, give God some praise. But, Pastor, I, I, I can't do that. The biggest thing that I, I believe with people, I'm not even going to finish the other note, is I hear us all the time, I can't do it. One of, the most, one of the most disappointing things that I experienced in street ministry was this. We did it for almost, what, eight, ten years Out of them 10 years, I think I got two or three preachers to preach one time. Every single preacher I asked told me the same thing. That's not my ministry. I don't have no call to do that. I said, you don't care about souls. You don't care about healing. God didn't call me. In other words, they just tell me God didn't call me. Whoa. Some of them might be listening. I've heard rephrased. But it's true. But here's what I'm saying. is the reason that we don't do something is we don't feel qualified. Or it's our calling. Or we're too bashful. Or we're this or that. The qualifications is not yours to say who's qualified. It's God's. And if he calls you, he qualifies you. Is that right? Yeah. And then you say, but I can't do that. There's not a person in this place that I can speak better than you. I twist my words. I can't pronounce words. Some of you don't know this. Sometimes I spend three or four hours to pronounce one word and get up here and pronounce it wrong. I don't tell you that because that's embarrassing. <laughs> when I mispronounce it, I see the smiles. I thought, yep, yeah, I knew a mystery panel. I have a trouble with a lot of sounds. If I went by that, I wouldn't do anything. There's not a person sitting here that is more bashful than me. I'm the most bashful person you ever met. I never talked to girls. I met Sister Becky. Basically, Lord, I'd rather fist fight somebody and talk to a girl because I'm embarrassed. I'm glad that my marriage lasted a lifetime because <laughs> there's no way I'd want to go back out there. Is that true? Is anybody else? That's me. You see, I stuttered, I'm bashful, I can't pronounce words, and yet God calls me. Let's go. My God, if any of that makes sense. If you don't think that God hears your prayers and your prophecy, you better listen. I'm closing. The harvest, the awakening's here if it's for us. We're going to go into it. We're going to pray for the labors, not the harvest. 
But I had forgotten this when I was about 17, 18 years old. I stood in East Knoxville about three, four blocks or five from where God gave us the great move of God. And I had found this building, a Catholic church that took up a whole city block. I negotiated the price from 500000 to 38000 I seen $38,000 raised the first service. And I wanted, and I knew that God told me to pastor. But because of my youth, the organization says, we're not letting you do that, Bill. We're bringing in somebody else. The guy they brought in told me, said, this ain't my job. He stayed about a month or two and left. But I, I stood outside on the sidewalk at night. I was hurt a little bit. Not too bad, a little bit. And the Lord spoke to me, and I said this out loud. There's three guys with me. They heard me say this. God spoke to me and said, I will give you this neighborhood. And I said, I looked at him. I said, God just gave me this neighborhood. I will give you thousands and thousands of souls. I said that. 20 years later, I'm sitting there. And God seeing souls saved so I had forgotten about that. And one time in my prayer, God reminded me. He said, did not I tell you to say that? So I'm going to tell you something. If you'll prophesy to yourself right now and say, I will be a part of the labor. God will make it come to pass. Kula basandaba. You say, Pastor, does anything discourage you? Not if I'm in the Spirit. If I'm by myself, everything would discourage me. My flesh is weak, but the weaker it gets, the stronger my spirit gets. And so I stand here this morning, and I'm telling you, we're going to see a move of God by the end of January, because not because of Bill Chapman, but in spite of Bill Chapman, because God said it. We're going to see an awakening sweep America and the world, not because somebody prophesied it, because God says it's going to happen. We're going to see men and women of all ages and all denominations and all walks of life say, I will be a part of this labor because God says I'm raising up a, a mighty army in this day and hour. Give God a praise. I don't know if I'll finish this next week or not, but I'm going to close with this thought. All through the Bible, all through it, when an enemy invaded a country, he invaded it at harvest time. Read it. You can go from Genesis all the way through. Every invasion was at harvest time. Because why would it, a foreign army come into a country and invade it if it wasn't harvest time. There was nothing there. You remember Gideon? It was harvest time. He was hiding behind the wine press trying to harvest enough barley to feed his family. It was harvest time. But God says, raise them up. It's always going to be harvest time when the enemy comes. So what am I telling you? I think it's time we become giant killers. Come on now. If you're, you gotta, you gotta stand. People are gonna say it's not gonna happen. They're gonna laugh. They're gonna mock. Do you know what's happening right now? It, it, that's happening and it's, it's coming home real fast and will be here probably by the end of the year. The church is being blamed for everything. The COVID is gonna be our fault. Even though the churches are empty, it's our fault. It's coming. I, I've heard it. I've heard it prophesied. I've heard of, I've already begun hearing politicians say it. You know what else? The economy's not going to recover like they think. You don't spend $30 trillion and go in debt and see things come back. Come on. Common sense will tell you that. But you know what God's going to do? The church is going to be so blessed. Yeah. We're going to have abundantly, and they're going to hate us for it. And they're going to say, what's wrong with them people? How come they're not suffering? And then when things begin to happen, 
when, they can't, when, when these things happen and they don't know how to fix it, when they don't know how to heal the sick and the church is healthy. I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about those that believe in Jesus Christ. There's a healing in this place. You see, they're going to despise us. But you know what? We're known to be an army that does not care. Do you think Gideon cared? You know what God did? He sowed such fear amongst the enemy that they begin to fight each other. You know what he did to Jehoshaphat? He, showed, he put such fear among the enemy that they fought their south. That's why David said, and the psalmist said, the battle is not yours, but it belongs to God. So we are on the winning side. Give the Lord a cup of worship. Don't allow the cloud of darkness on you. It's a season. Just jump ahead just a second and close. You know why Gideon only ended up with 300 people? We always preach it because God wanted him. Everybody know that God done it. I'm going to tell you, everybody's going to know God done it no matter what. You know why Gideon ended up with 300 people? Because out of 30,000, there's only 300 willing to do what God said. That's point blank. Look at it. Read it. They had an intention, a good will, but they didn't have the, the go forward. There's a multitude that's got good will. Cop told me one time, good intentions and in 50 cents would buy you a cup of coffee. Well, it takes about a buck and a half now for good intentions. But all I'm saying this, good intentions won't do it. But those that go into the labor field, I want to pray for labors right now. Would you stand to your feet? Heavenly Fathers, we enter this Christmas season. I want you to take notice of this. You say, Pastor, is this a prayer? Yes, it is. But every business right now would hire anybody that walked in the doors because they're desperate for labors. Every business has signs outside, now hard, now hard. Sometimes when you get a receipt, it says right on there, we are now hiring. They're desperate. Desperate for workers. I'm going to tell you something. In the work that God's sending us out, we don't going to put up now hiring signs. We're going to pray to the Lord of the harvest. God send forth labors. I don't know about how you do things, how your experience is, but this is one thing I've learned in my experience. When you pray for something, you will become the husbandary. You'll do it first. Amen? You see what I'm saying? If you're praying for labors, you will become a laborer in the field. If you're not already, I believe you are. But you will become more. Because you can't pray for something like that, unless God uses you in it. But we're going to see labors come forth. And let me tell you something. They're not going to be bagged to come to church. I get chewed out all the time because I never bag nobody to come to church. I will not remind you to come to church. If you want to come to church, come. If you don't, don't. People say, ain't it a pastor's way? Yes, it is. Because I'm not a babysitter. I went to church and the pastor had to call everybody every service so they wouldn't come. He didn't have a church. He had a bunch of babies. Here's what I believe. If you're called to be a laborer and God calls you into it, God's sending forth laborers here that's ready to go. You know what the hold is? When God asked me, and I told you he'd show me the rest of this, when he said, would you let them work in the harvest? In other words, there are going to be so many, you're going to try to hold them back. You're not going to hold them back because God's going to send them. There's labors coming right now. Heavenly Father, Lord, we need, we're praying for labors, God. Lord, there's an old saying that we used to see hanging in a lot of churches. And it said, why don't somebody do something? And then I realized I was somebody. 
God, we want people right here. We're praying for laborers that are waiting to go. This is going to be their life. We're going to ask for young. God, we're just asking for laborers to go forth into this harvest that you've prepared for this day and time. Those that will pray for the sick. Those that will pray deliverance. Those that will do signs and wonders, God. Lord, we're not asking them to dot every eye like we might think they should. We're just asking for laborers that you send. In the name of Jesus. And God, I pray if there's anyone right here, Lord, that we're ready for increase into this walk. Lord, we're asking for direction. And that when you say go, God, we go with the authority and the robe. And God, we're not going to stop with just one walk around. We're going to wear our shoes out, claiming territory. And the church says, give the Lord a clap of worship. Holy, you say, Pastor, that ain't much of a Christmas. But if you think about it, it is Christmas. That's what we need. Let somebody else know about Jesus. Do you love the Lord? Amen. The pastor and Sister Becky Wicks wishes everybody a Merry Christmas. And we want you to have the best of the best. Amen? Amen. Shake hands, smile, spread some sunshine, and don't forget, next Sunday.